Hello. Please continue your lunch while our guest speaker makes her presentation. If you're like me, you often scratch your head when you hear about climate science deniers. Matter of fact, I talked to a couple this morning. It was interesting. So how many, how, so can, how can so many people deny what science research has proven with data, hard evidence? Our speaker may shed some light on that puzzling question. Her research focuses on the social structure of science and how the public's understanding of science, of structure relates to trust in science, excuse me. Please give a warm welcome to, jo <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Joanna Huckster, Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies at Eckerd College. Thank you. Hello. I hope everyone has had a wonderful time so far. My name is Joanna Huckster. Um, I go by Joe. Uh, and I am a, the, an assistant professor of environmental studies at Eckerd College. And I'm here to talk to you today about communicating beyond the choir. Um, public understanding, public denial, and climate change communication. Uh, I've actually been uh, in the area, in Florida, for the last year and a half. And almost since I got here, I've been hawking this talk all around the Bay Area. Um, so I am trying to get this presentation and these, these pieces of information and these tools out to as many people as possible. So I'm really happy to be here to do that for you today. Um, I actually study public understanding of climate change and climate change communication. Uh, that's my research focus uh, at Eckerd and has been since my dissertation. So, I don't know about you, but for me, climate change is often the huge, hot elephant in the room. It's the thing that a lot of people know is happening, especially here in Florida. A lot of people are aware that something is going on, but they don't really want to talk about it. And I've sort of made it my mission in life to try to change this. This is something that's really important to me, because I think it's one of the most important things we can do about climate change, is make it something that people feel comfortable having a conversation about. So, before I start talking about the different ways that you can communicate about climate change, I want to talk to you about a few people who are doing it really, really well. So this woman is Catherine Hayhoe. Catherine Hayhoe is a climate scientist, and she's also an evangelical Christian. And because of the type of person that she is and the values that she holds, she's able to reach an audience that many of us are not able to communicate effectively with. Uh, she has an extensive body of work about communicating climate change, so she works much more than just in the science itself. Um, and I highly recommend looking her up. Um, the other program I'd like to talk to you about is something called the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. Uh, and this is um, a group of psychologists and social scientists at both Yale and George Mason universities. And they work together to look at the best practices for communicating climate change. Um, they have online many guides and materials about how to communicate climate change. I highly recommend looking these up as well. And I'm gonna be using some of their data in this presentation, including different maps about public opinion on climate change throughout the United States. And I'll let you know when I'm showing you one of those. Bless you. So, climate change and the environment tend to rank pretty low on people's concerns, the things they're most concerned about in the United States. Uh, and so this table shows you a list of things that Americans are concerned about in the United States, national problems, and the environment is all the way down here at the bottom. And this is for 2018, but this looks the same basically every year going back uh, into the past. So the environment ranks pretty low. Even though most people will say that they're environmentalists, they are more concerned about things like race relations, immigration, healthcare, uh, economy in general. This year, um, dissatisfaction with the government moved up to the top, so that's pretty interesting. Um, and if you just ask them about the environment, Climate change ranks at the bottom of those issues. Um, so things like drinking water pollution, uh, the pollution of the air, extinction of species usually rank above it. Now this is 2014, 2015, 2016 data. Uh, in 2018, I'm sorry, in 2017, uh, global warming moved up. Um, it is now above uh, loss of tropical rainforests and extinctions of plant and animal species. Um, but remember, we're still talking about the environment, which is still the lowest category in people's concerns. So the question is, how do we change this? 
how do we make this a high priority for people? Because if it's not a high priority for them, it's not going to be what they vote on, for example. So to do this, we have to first understand why. What do people understand about climate change? Why is there so much denial about climate change in the United States? And why has it become so political? And when we understand these things, we can start to figure out the best ways to move past them and to communicate past them. So let's start with public understanding. What matters when it comes to public understanding of climate change? Well, first, people have a tendency to not really understand the science behind it. Now, we don't all need a Nobel Prize worthy understanding of climate scientists to do something, but we do have to have a basic concept. One thing that happens is that people frequently confuse climate change with other environmental issues. And most often, people confuse it with the hole in the ozone layer. Um, so when you give surveys to people asking them what causes climate change, what anthropogenic things cause climate change, what human causes are there for climate change, they say, um, we are creating a hole in the ozone layer that's letting in more heat from the sun and that's making us warmer. I have students that say this now, you know, 19 year olds. So this is a very long standing confusion. Even though for those students, CFCs have been banned in the United States since before they were born, um, hole in the ozone layer is not something that makes the news all the time. It's still something they're confused about. The other confusion that happens a lot is the difference between weather and climate. Weather are short term localized things, right? Occurrences. Climate is a much longer term uh, and, a, and it involves the sort of um, evening out of trends over time. It doesn't have to do with what's happening on one day at a time. And so in order to try to explain this for, to people, I like to use a metaphor. And I actually have two, but I'm gonna give one now and one later. You can hold on for that one. Um, the one I'm gonna use now is climate is how you decide where it is that you're going to go on vacation. Right? You want to go somewhere warm and sunny, or since we live in Florida, maybe we want to go someplace with snow so we can go ski. Um, it's how you decide where you're going to go on vacation. Weather is, is how you decide what you're going to pack. Right? You still check the weather and see if it's going to rain while you're there. So climate is long-term trends. Weather is short-term localized. Another thing that people misunderstand about climate change is the consensus, the scientific consensus about the anthropogenic causes, the human causes of climate change. Public tends to underestimate that scientific consensus. How much? Well, we know that there is about a 97 to 99% agreement among climate scientists that climate change is caused by humans. However, the public thinks it's about 45% of climate scientists who think that climate change is caused by humans. That is a massive gap. So this is one of the things that we can try to work on and try to change in order to help people understand the urgency of climate change. Um, this data comes from the Consensus Project, uh, and you can look them up. They have lots of different ideas about how to communicate the consensus better. All right, the last couple of things we need to know about climate change. Uh, and that the public doesn't understand. The urgency and the consequences. People tend to think of climate change as something that's going to happen very far away, very far in the future, and perhaps not even to humans. And it's because of this that I hate the polar bear as the symbol of climate change. Polar bears are not people, and although a lot of people think polar bears are cute, they don't actually care about them as much as they care about their daily lives and what it is they like to do. They don't care about them probably as much as they care about their SUV. Um, also, polar bears are really mean. Um, so using the polar bear as the symbol for climate change actually reinforces the idea that it's happening far away, like the Arctic, and that it is not happening to people. Last, the thing that people don't understand about climate change is what the heck they can do about it. And people tend to fall into two camps. Either they believe that the problem is way too big to solve and there's nothing they can do about it and so they don't feel effective at all. Many of us probably fit in that camp every once in a while. Or they feel like they already do their part, right? I recycle, I'm great, I don't have to do anything else. This is also problematic. So we need to move people past these two ends of the spectrum on how to deal with climate change. All right, so this is public understanding. So then the next question is, why is there still so much denial in the United States about the occurrence of climate change? 
And there are an increasing number of Americans who believe that climate change is real, that it's happening, but far fewer believe that it's caused by human activity. And that opinion varies by location. So this is one of the Yale Project on Climate Change Communications maps. And what they do is they give these uh, national surveys uh, and they use them to um, extrapolate data from all the different states telling you what percentage of Americans believe certain things. So the question they asked here is the percentage of adults who think global warming is mostly caused by human activities. This is the 2014 data. I'm going to update you, don't worry. If it is, if you can't read the numbers, if the numbers, I'm sorry, if the color in the state is blue, that means there are fewer than 50% uh, of people believe that global warming is caused by mostly human activities. The darker blue, the lower the number. If it's yellow or moving into red, that means that people, more than 50% of people, believe that global warming is caused mostly by human activities. So this is 2014. This is 2016. So we have more yellow states. And now I'm going to give you some good news. Here's 2018. This is pretty good, OK? Just in six years, we've seen a pretty big increase in the number of people who believe that global warming is caused by human activities. I'm not going to give you a ton of good news today, but this is one of the pieces. <laughs> so we're, the national average is about 52%. Uh, interestingly, Florida is like a perfect example for the entire US. We are also at 52%. In fact, every year we're about the same as the national average. Um, so this is the percentage of people who believe that global warming is caused mostly by human activities. But there's still denial. 52% is not that high. So why? Well, psychologically, climate change is the perfect storm for denial. The reason is that we tend to do a few things. We tend to think short term, like immediate survival. Like, how am I going to get to the end of the day? I have to make dinner. I have to get the kids home. I have these projects due for work. How am I going to get there? Uh, and climate change, as you all know, is not a short-term problem. Another thing is that we tend to assess catastrophes, even ones that are very, very rare, as much riskier than long-term problems. So an example of this is flying in airplanes. People are significantly more likely to be afraid of flying in airplanes than they are of driving in their car even though you're statistically much more likely to get into a car accident than you are to get into an airplane crash, even if you're a frequent flyer. And it makes sense. Airplanes fall out of the sky, right? Like, that's a long way down, fiery, big crash. That's really scary. Um, but the car crash is way more likely to happen to you. Part of it is that you have your own agency when you're driving, right? You feel like, I have control over this. And when you're flying in the plane, I don't know, maybe a few of you are pilots, but probably not that many. Um, but we tend to assess these catastrophes as much riskier, even though they're way less likely. And another thing that we tend to do is be very social and tribal. We care a lot about conforming with our tribe or social norms. We don't often like to admit that, but over and over the science shows that it's true. So the last one is that psychologically we tend to be kind of resistant to change. You've probably noticed this in your lives. Um, we don't love change. And climate change is going to mean we have to make big changes. Um, we may have to, sp it, depending on our ideological groups, go against the people we feel like we are in a tribe with. Um, this is a long-term catastrophe, not a huge one impact, except for, you know, every storm that hits us. Uh, long term, it's sort of just happening at the low level. It's not like sea level rise happens in one day. Um, so all of these things make climate change the perfect storm for denial. Also, there are actually two types of denial. So when you think of climate change denial, you probably think of your crazy Uncle Joe, and I can call him that because my name's Joe, so it's okay. Um, your crazy Uncle Joe who doesn't believe in climate change and is a, like really pushes that it's not us or it's not real. But there are actually two types. That type is active denial. However, the other type of denial is passive denial. And passive denial, in my mind, is actually much more insidious. This is knowing that climate change is real and that humans are causing it, but not really doing anything about it. Not changing any of your habits or not trying to talk to anyone about it. That's passive denial. That's still acting like maybe it's not going to happen if I really hope hard enough. 
And that one is the harder barrier to break through because I'm pretty sure everybody has moments of passive denial if they don't live their whole lives that way. So one way that we continue our own denial is we apply uh, psychological tools to preserve the beliefs that we already have. One of these is something called confirmation bias. Uh, and I explain confirmation bias in this way. Let's say you're having an argument with somebody and you decide to solve this argument by going to Google, because that's what we do now when we have a fight. And you Google this argument, you Google the information, and the first two hits that you get don't agree with your stance, but the third one does. Which link are you going to hit? I mean, unless you're a better person than I am, you're going to hit the third one, because that one agrees with your side of the argument. And that's called confirmation bias. That's looking for information that conforms to what you already believe. So people use that when they're looking for information about climate change and lots of other things. And also, like I said, we have tribalism, which is we try to stick to the beliefs of our tribe. This could be our family, this could be our religion, this could be our political ideology. There are lots of different tribes to which we believe in order to not be ostracized from them. And there are studies that show that people actually value loyalty to their tribe, to their social group, over the absolute truth. And this can help explain why ideologies have become so polarized on climate change. So how polarized? Well, climate change, as you know, has become very political. This graph shows threat perception by party of climate change um, from 2001 to about halfway to, through 2013. And what you'll probably notice is, I'm pointing to this one, I, I hope people can see that, um, that the Democrats and also this lighter blue line is liberals uh, have been a little steady but slowly moving up. And Republicans and this lighter pink line is conservatives have been moving down. And this is the average of everybody, staying about the same in the middle here. But you can see that the gap from 2001 and the gap in 2013 is, has changed a lot, right? We have had what we call this the, the pie wedge graph. We keep seeing this over and over and over again. But if you took this graph back to the early 80s, uh, I'm sorry, the late 80s or the early 90s, there would be no difference. Uh, this was not politicized at the time. Republicans and Democrats were in the same place on climate change. There's some great footage out there of President George W. Bush saying that he was going to act on climate change at the time global warming. So this has become increasingly polarized over time. Now part of that has to do with, some of you may know, about a pretty well-funded fossil fuel campaign to try to instill doubt in the public mind. Um, but Lots of things, lots of our issues in the United States have become polarized over this same time period. So this is a trend on many issues. So it's very political. So we know these things now. We know how denial happens. We know how it becomes so easy for people. So the next question is, for those of us who know that climate change is anthropogenic, do we talk about climate change? Are we talking about it? So we're back to the Yale maps. This one is the percentage of adults in 2018 who believe that global warming is happening, not anthropogenic, just happening. This is pretty good. Uh, this is about 73%, okay? This map I showed you before, this is the percentage of adults who thinks it's caused by human activities. So believe it's happening, human activities. All right, next I'm going to show you the, the percentage of adults who say they talk about climate change at least occasionally what percentage do we think that is? 10, few, 10%, 15? Okay, well you all are a little low, but it's still pretty low. <laughs> it's about 30%. So about a third, or less than a third of the US says they talk about climate change at least occasionally. Okay, I'm going back. This is how many people know it's happening. This is how many people say they're talking about it. This is the problem, okay? Climate change is right now a taboo subject. Nobody wants to be the person at the party who is the downer who talks about climate change the whole time. Um, this is at least the example I use with my students. Um, they don't want to be that person. Some of them do, actually. Um, so this is what I want us to fix. All right, so if we're going to fix this, how do we do it? Who should we be talking to? 
How do we make those people care? How do we make them think that it's important? And what are the most important pieces of information to communicate to them, especially if you don't really have that much time? Sometimes you can plan a huge conversation, but sometimes, like me, you're in your Uber or your taxi or your Lyft, and the driver wants to talk to you about climate change. And uh, you only have a few minutes. So what's most important to communicate? So although that graph I showed you that had the two lines separating makes it seem like there are only two camps in the United States about climate change, that's actually wrong. There's actually a spectrum of belief in the United States when it comes to climate change. Uh, and we tend to overestimate how many people actually will disagree with us at a fundamental level. So the Yale program did something called the Six Americas Project. And they asked, uh, people a spectrum of questions that gave them these six different types of Americans when it comes to climate change. The alarmed, the concerned, the cautious, the disengaged, the doubtful, and the dismissive. So the alarmed are people who are convinced and already taking action. The con concerned are convinced but not yet taking action. We have people who believe it's happening but that it's not a personal threat. Uh, people who haven't even thought about it. This group, the disengaged, who say they haven't thought about it, um, are actually the most likely to also say they would change their mind if someone had a conversation with them. The doubtful, who believe it's either not happening or it's not their fault. And then the dismissive. Dismissive is crazy Uncle Joe. Uh, the people who will fight you to tell you that it's absolutely not caused by humans and they're actively engaged on the other side. This is 2016 data. Here is 2018 data. So the dismissive is down to 9% of the population. That's pretty good. Uh, alarmed and concerned, we have almost 60% of the population. So when you put the, the alarmed through the disengaged together, that's 82% of the population in the US. That means eight out of 10 random people that you speak to, and not in this room, I'm sure you get 10 out of 10 in this room, um, will be able to have a productive conversation with you about climate change. That's way, way less intimidating than 50-50, at least to me. Okay, so let's get ready to talk about climate change. What I want you to do is think of a person who you either want to talk to or are afraid to talk to about climate change. This person can be anybody, but the strategies that you use for having this conversation will be different depending on who they are. So take a second, think of your person. <laughs> if you have a way to get to Donald Trump, good for you, we should talk. <laughs> All right, and now what I want you to do is set a goal for yourself. What are you trying to achieve with this conversation? And setting a goal is really important um, because it actually helps you. The goal helps you start the conversation. It helps you stay focused. Where are you trying to go with this? And it also helps you remember that you don't have to win. So the goal of your conversation does not have to be, I am going to take this climate change denier and convert them into a climate change believer in 30 minutes. That's pretty unlikely. The goal of your conversation can actually just be to have it. I want to start a very calm, rational conversation with this person and not leave screaming at each other and angry. That can be the whole goal. Uh, your goal could be just to transmit one important piece of information that you think that person needs to know. That could be the entire goal of the conversation. It makes it, again, less intimidating to start if you're not trying to go through everything and convert somebody and win. Okay, have your person, set your goal, Ooh, that was loud. First, we're gonna talk about what doesn't work. We have a list of things that do, but let's talk about what doesn't work. The first thing is using really complicated scientific information, statistics, numbers, jargon. There are very few people for which this is an effective communication technique. Now, I'm about to throw my husband under the bus. Um, he's the only person I've ever converted into a climate believer with numbers, and that's because he's an engineer. Engineers are different. Um, everybody else, this really isn't a great tactic. They've seen the numbers, probably, especially if they're a denier. They've already seen the numbers. Somebody's already tried to show them the graphs. That's not gonna go anywhere. Another thing that doesn't work and seems counterintuitive is very, very sad emotional pleas. And why is this? This is because we all have what's called a finite pool of worry. 
We only have so many things that we can be worried about in a day, right? We are trying to worry about deadlines and taking care of family members and whether or not dinner is going to be on the table tonight. And we have so many things that we are concerned about on a daily basis that when you get home and relax and that Sarah McLaughlin commercial for ASPCA comes on with the sad music and the sad puppy eyes, you probably change channels because you just can't right now. You're emotionally done. And that's the exact same thing that happens if somebody comes at you and tells you, we're all gonna die from climate change. I can't, I, I don't have time for this. Um, so apocalyptic pleas, very sad emotional pleas, are not actually as effective as one might think. Um, something that, talking about things that are happening far away and far into the future, again, not particularly useful. Again, we think short term, we're worried about things that are happening close to us, not on the other side of the world. We're not as worried about polar bears as we all like to say we are. Sorry, Siri. Um, <laughs> and finally, yelling, getting angry, fighting. That just leads to stronger entrenchment. That does not generally work. When was the last time that you had a screaming argument with somebody and then walked away and said, you know what, they had some really good points. I'm definitely going to change my mind on that. No, it doesn't work. You're just going to be further entrenched in the things you already believe in that you were right. Um, so if you start to get angry with somebody, if they start yelling, it's time to actually walk away from the conversation. All right, that's what doesn't work. So let's talk about what does. I have four simple steps. I know you're always supposed to have three, but I haven't figured out how to make it three yet, so we're still on four. So the first is know your audience, get their attention, address their understanding some of the time, and empower them to act. All right, so we'll start with know your audience. What is most important to the person you're going to speak to or the group you're going to speak to in life? Now, this can be really hard if, for example, you're me and you have to talk to your Lyft driver. Um, it, you, don't, you don't have a lot of time, you don't know anything about them. But if this is someone you know already, this is a really good place to start. What is really important to them? Which America are they? So those six Americas, that spectrum, where do they fall on that? How far are they in terms of their belief, their understanding, where, where are they? And what do they already know about climate change? If you can gather this information beforehand, it can really help. If you can't, one way to do that is to sort of gather it in the beginning of your conversation. So I try when I'm talking to my Lyft driver to get some information from him or her before we get going. It's almost always men who want to ask me if I believe in it. Um, I just realized that. Uh, <laughs> okay, so step two is get their attention. So you're using information from step one to do step two. And the thing you're doing is something called framing. Framing is finding an angle that makes climate change salient to them. It makes it matter to them personally. So the first way to do this, especially if you don't really know the person, is to set the issue as close to home, as now, as near term, something happening in the near future. That's pretty easy to do here in, in Florida, uh, especially with sea level rise and hurricanes. Um, when I used to give this talk in central Pennsylvania, it was a little bit more difficult. I had to sort of extend out a little bit. But Florida, that's not too hard to do. Another thing you can do is focus on an issue that is very resonant with that person's interests um, or their subgroups or their religious groups or their affiliations, their job. Um, so if somebody really loves to fish here, you can actually start the conversation by talking about how climate change will affect fish populations in Florida. Is that the most important thing? No. Is that the thing that you want to talk about most? Probably not, maybe it is, um, but it is something that matters to them, so it's a really good way to get started. Um, other things to talk about, impact on health care. Um, if someone has a really strong economic background or cares a lot about the economy, impact on economics. Uh, if they are very religious, one angle that's shown to work is talking about stewardship of the earth. Um, and the final way to frame climate change that we've sort of missed over the last, you know, however many decades now of trying to talk about it, is opportunity framing rather than sacrifice framing. This is true for a lot of environmental messages. We often are talking about what you're going to have to give up, right? You have to give up your car. You have to give up traveling. You have to stop using the shower so much. You have to stop using so much electricity. These are sacrifices. And what we aren't talking about is the opportunities that we're going to get from the changes that could be made. So 
the opportunity for us to live cleaner, healthier lives, the opportunity for jobs to be made in the renewable sector that are safer and more long-term. These are opportunities for the future rather than things people are giving up from their lives. So this is another type of framing that works really well. And the other thing I'll say here is to start your conversations with a grain of truth. Well, what does that mean? That means that you want the person you're speaking to to feel like you are listening to them and not just talking over them or yelling facts at them. So you start with a grain of truth. You repeat back something they've said to you as true. So let's say you start the conversation and um, the person says, you know what, I am so worried about so many things right now, I just don't have time to be worried about that. You could say, you know what, that's true. There are so many things to be worried about right now. What is most important to you? What are you most worried about? When you're doing that, you're repeating back what they said, you're telling them they're right, you're making them feel heard, and you're also about to get some information. What are they most concerned about? Because chances are, whatever they're most concerned about can also be tied to climate change. And you can have that information as part of your frame. So start your conversation with a grain of truth. Step three, three out of four, we're almost there. Address their understanding, and you have to do that without making people feel stupid. Nobody likes to be made to feel stupid. So, like I said, numbers jargon don't work very well for most people. Save the science for the curious, the confused, the concerned. If you are talking to someone who is dis dismissive, who is in complete denial about climate change, the science, unfortunately, doesn't really matter. And you may have had this experience already. You may know a denier who you've tried to tell the science to, and they just, they have more science to back it up why they're right. Um, it doesn't work. And like we remember, the dismissive are only 9% of the population. It's actually not worth your time and energy to fight really hard with them on the science. You're just going to discourage yourself, and you're not going to change them. Um, it sounds sad to say ignore those people, but move on. There are more, many more people out there who are much more important to convince. Keep the science that you do talk about simple. So avoid complicated jargon. Uh, directly address misconceptions. If you find out that this person believes that the hole in the ozone layer is causing climate change, you should tell them that that's not what's happening and explain it to them. Because this can affect the behaviors they think are correct. Um, they're going to stop buying aerosol cans, for instance, if they think CFCs cause climate change. I've had students tell me that. CFCs are illegal. There are no CFCs in your aerosol cans. But they don't seem to remember this or know this. And metaphors are effective. So I told you about my metaphor for um, traveling and, and the difference between weather and climate. I have another weather and climate one. If somebody says to you that it's snowing where I am, therefore climate change isn't real, you can tell them that's like taking a ruler and putting it on the ground and saying, look, the earth is flat. You're zoomed in too far. Okay, you need to zoom out and look at the bigger trend. The Earth is flat right there, but the bigger trend is the Earth is round. If you, unless you're dealing with a flat earther, just move on. <laughs> um, it's the same concept. Uh, another um, metaphor that I really like is a baseball one, and it has to do with hurricanes. So if someone asks you if an individual hurricane is caused by climate change, uh, like Irma, um, it is like, let's say you have a baseball player and you're wondering whether or not that player is on steroids. Okay, so any home run that that player hits, you can't point to that one home run and say that home run happened because they took drugs. However, if there's a pattern of that player hitting nine home runs in every single game, that pattern might be because they are somehow enhancing their performance, right? So if there's a pattern of bigger, stronger hurricanes over time, that is a pretty good indicator that those things are connected to climate change, but you can't say Irma happened because of climate change. Does that make sense? Okay, so those are some of the metaphors that people find effective. And you may need to avoid buzzwords. If you're talking to somebody who really is pretty dismissive about climate change, you may not be able to say greenhouse gases, for instance. You might wanna say heat trapping gases. You may even have to have the conversation without ever saying global warming or climate change. That's a challenge, but it's totally possible. It is totally possible to have a wonderful conversation about renewable energy, for example, without ever connecting it to climate or global warming. OK, we're on our last step, empowering people to act. So 
You have to do this without making them feel too guilty. And you have to emphasize effective action. People are more likely to feel like concerned about an issue if they feel like there's something they can actually do about it. So, what are some of the things you can tell people to do? You can explain personal actions they can take, and that's a good thing to do. However, personal actions by themselves are not going to fix anything. Just like our tragedy of the conference conversation, um, most people realize that if they are the only ones doing something, like driving their car less, that that's not going to fix the global problem, right? Um, and so you can tell them the things they can do, eat less meat, uh, for instance, drive their car less, change all their light bulbs. But if I am changing all of the light bulbs in my house, uh, I'm not fixing global warming if I don't tell people about it. So the importance here is that this becomes something that we are talking about at a broader level than just doing individual actions. One thing you can also do is warn them about single action bias. So this is basically taking one action and then thinking you're off the hook. So maybe you know somebody who says, I recycle, I've done my part. That's not enough. Just recycling is not enough to deal with climate change. Uh, and in fact, there's some sort of boomerangs that happen. So for instance, some people may actually take a good environmental action and then actually do worse on their other things. Like I've recycled or I eat vegan, so I can travel all over the world as much as I want and drive my car as much as I want. Like it somehow evens out. It doesn't. I've done the calculation for myself. Um, Something you can do is harness the power of social norms, because people are more likely to act if they think that other people are acting. Uh, an example of this, how many of you have been to a hotel that has a little placard in the bathroom that says, um, please reuse your towel to save the planet? Right? Some of you have seen these. So a study was done. If that placard says 75% of our guests reuse their towels, people are much more likely to reuse their towels because it's the social norm. It is the thing that is expected of them in that situation. So remind them of the things that other people are taking. This is another reason why telling other people that you're changing your light bulbs is enforcing the idea of the social norm. It's better than just doing it yourself. This is what my neighbors are doing too. Okay, I should do this. And of course, remind them to take political and social action. These are much more important things than uh, changing your light bulbs, for example. And of course, most importantly, encourage them to talk to others. Encourage them to have the conversation that you're having with them. I'm glad we had this talk. I hope that you're able to have this talk with your friend or your neighbor or your mom. Final pointers. Do not pressure yourself to get it all correct. You do not have to win every conversation. It is highly likely that every one of you in this room knows more than the average person about climate change. You don't have to worry that someone's gonna shoot you down with these crazy facts that you've never heard of, okay? You, you do not have to get everything right every time. Know when to exit gracefully. If you're screaming, if people are mad at one another, if there's fighting happening, it's time to end the conversation. Nothing good is gonna happen after that. And don't forget your grains of truth. Don't forget to make the person feel heard, to make the person feel like you understand what they're saying, you understand their points, even though you have your own and you have a different opinion, because that will keep things calm. My parting note here is that climate change cannot be a taboo subject anymore. If we aren't talking about it, then we aren't taking social action on it. If we aren't taking social action, then political action is not going to happen. Uh, and we need that political action to move past climate change. Talking about it is one of the most effective actions that you can take to deal with climate change. Thank you. Well, Joe, thank you. Of course. Um, we're a little bit over, but if the sense of the house is you don't mind being a little bit over so we can still complete our final uh, take action activity, uh, I would ask that we extend for like five minutes of Q&A if you would like to ask uh, Joe's any questions. Any questions? There's uh, one back here. Get my own mic. Right there, right there, right there, right there. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, one observation is that the master of framing is Donald Trump, but he makes up 
these things. So you're dealing with somebody who now with this whole, uh, what's the Green New Deal? He's latched onto that. Pardon? Pardon? Oh. No, let him talk. No, no. It, well, no, he's a master at this. So he actually does exactly what uh, you uh, pointed out here. So he's uh, saying, well, you can't drive your cars. You've got all this other, all these negative things uh, that really they haven't proposed. So how do you counteract something like that when somebody's coming at you with, oh, my God, not real facts, mm -hmm. alternative facts? Yeah. So I would say that there's a difference between um, telling alternative facts and framing. Um, I, first of all, want to really emphasize that um, framing, if you are taking it to an extreme where you are not necessarily being truthful, you're not framing anymore, you're lying. Um, and so it's really important ethically when we're framing to make sure that we're being very, very honest with what we're doing. Um, countering the alternative facts is, is really hard. Um, and uh, it's something that a lot of people have been studying. Uh, it's actually, there's actually a whole new field of study coming up to talk about how to deal with fake news. Uh, and how to do with deal with alternative frame or I'm sorry alternative facts um, and so this is sort of a, an emerging field but I think the only thing that we can do for now is continue to talk about the truth but also to make sure that we are tailoring our message to our individual audience and also realizing that the people who are most in denial of climate change are still even now, even with um, the things that have been happening on a national level, uh, are still a very, very small part of the United States. And it isn't actually that half of the US denies climate change, it's that half of the US doesn't think it's an important enough issue to vote on. And so that's the part we need to be targeting, is how it is we can get people to understand it's going to affect them, uh, and it's going to affect them in the near future, so that it becomes something they want to vote on. Uh, we have time for one more question, and I'm going to do this again. I did this yesterday. Um, is, there, is there a women's voice in the room that has a question? A w yes. Hi, and it relates very much to what you just asked. Do you find there's a difference when you are uh, communicating with men or women on this issue is there any consistent difference? Obviously, there's a lot of similarities between us. Right, so one thing to point out is that um, in, when we look at national trends in who um, is more concerned about climate change, women are more concerned about climate change. Um, it's one of the only um, indicative um, demographics out there, um, gender and political ideology. Uh, generally, none of the rest of them really make a difference. Um, so women tend to be more concerned about most environmental issues, actually. Uh, and so having the conversation uh, tends to be easier with women. Uh, and I, I actually said earlier that um, I've never had a female Lyft driver ask me if climate change is real, um, but I've had a lot of male Lyft drivers and taxi drivers ask me that. That being said, once the conversation actually gets going, um, the, most of the tactics remain the same. The conversation itself, um, I think maybe the only issues that I might have have to do with how young I might look to them and my gender rather than actually the, the facts. It's not like you know women are better at facts um, than men. Uh, what? <laughs> That's why we brought contrary you. Contrary to popular belief. <laughs> <laughs> we have one more. One more. Yes, Libby. Uh, can we have a microphone for Libby, please? Okay, um, so yeah, it's I just wanted to kind of bring up the issue, and I'm not exactly sure where the question is, but I'll keep it short, and it's that, you know, when we look at the concerns of people in Florida, um, you know, the concerns are very high on, on water and the environment and natural resources uh, and climate change, uh, and people tend to vote that way on amendments, mm -hmm. um, but they're not necessarily voting that way for elected officials because they have, you know, often a you know, sometimes single issue voters or other things that they find of greater concern. Right. Um, so I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. And I don't want to like, you know, get totally into politics and say one way is right or one way is wrong. And I'm very cautiously optimistic of our current governor right now who seems to be, you know, focusing on the environment and water quality. Um, so, yeah. 
So I think one, one of the reasons why I think that has happened is that for many, many years, the environmental movement in general has uh, focused a lot on what each individual person can do. And because they have, the, the major environmental organizations have wanted to stay out of politics. And so one of the ways that we have sort of modeled the environment in our heads as something that we take action on, not something that the uh, politicians should take action on. And so I think that's one of the reasons why people don't actually tend to vote at the um, national or at the uh, you know, elected officials level um, on environmental issues. That's not their number one issue. So I think one of the things we can do as, communicate, as communicators is emphasize how important it's going to be for social and political action to happen, not just for you to change what type of car you drive uh, or to reduce your energy use in your home. That's important, but we really, at this point, it is too late for those measures to work. We need political action. And so that's one of the things I think as communicators, we need to make sure people understand that this is where, this is where we have to go now. Thank you very much. So um, because you are a person of honesty and truth and uh, transparency, Professor Huckster, yes. we yes. have for you wow. this beautiful book by one of our co-chairs who couldn't be with us, um, Richard Jacobs. He is uh, one of the advising attorneys to the Children's Trust lawsuit. And he's a uh, amateur photographer. He's gone around the world. He's taken these beautiful, luscious pictures wow. and then written um, a climate conscious text with it. That's we fantastic. know you will enjoy Thank this you. very much. Thank you so much. Would this is you beautiful. please uh, extend our love and appreciation for Professor Joanna Huckster, thank you for being with us. Um, our final activity is going to ask you to uh, reorganize yourselves into um, three different groups. Um, and this is act, uh, this, these are action groups. So we're going to have a table. I'm just going to say it's going to meet over here that wants to start uh, the serious conversation on serious games in... Um, in uh, our neck of the woods. So if you would like to start the, the conversation and be planning around serious games to get something going before we're in the heat of the hurricane season, please meet over here where Dr. Michael McDonald has just sat. If you would like to be part of the conversation around communities of opportunity and uh, resiliency hubs and what's going, where, where are people going to go for resources if the big event happens and, and et cetera, et cetera. Would you please meet over here where the PSR people are? Um, that just happened naturally, organically, and by divine will. So I think that's wonderful. Just meet over in that area. And if you don't want to be in one of those two groups, but you're really interested in what everybody's been thinking and saying, what they might want to do, please meet at the back of the room where Maria is waving her hands and Libby's going to be joining, and they're going to take you through an activity of trying to make sense of everybody's post-it notes. You can still add post-it notes, I might add, as well. So please quickly reorganize yourself into one of the three areas so we can complete our final activity and know that not only did we listen to, talk about, but we're also taking action on the climate that affects each and every one of us. Thank you very much. And um, we're going we're gonna to try and take uh, about 20, 25 minutes to do this. Um, and uh, I ask your leave if we go over just a couple of minutes more than what the program said.